And by this point in our lecture, you're probably asking yourself, why the hell are we still wasting your time and talking about some weird stuff? You've already learned about all those cool algorithms. So indeed you have learned about how do you train with Monte Carlo, you've learned about the Q-learning as a particular case of temporal difference learning. Those two algorithms are awesome, but there's one missing link to them that would prevent them from learning efficiently. This missing link comes from a problem that you have already solved in week one. But let's recapitulate it on a different example to get it more kind of obvious to you. Let's say you're still trying to take a robot for a walk, so you want to control your robot so, so that it walks forward as fast and as um, harmless as possible. And you give it reward for basically the amount of distance it covers at each particular step. Now, imagine that you are training by Q learning, and at the beginning your Q values are zero. So what's going to happen is, first your robot's going to, there's probably high chance it's going to fall, because it's really hard to, uh, it's really a lucky situation if you manage to walk by a random permutation of actions. So the first situation is your robot um, falls down on its knees and maybe crawls forward, and still gets a reward, so it has positive Q functions for those actions. Now, isn't it awesome? So it's already learned something. The bad part is that it's probably the entire thing it's capable to learn in this way. The problem here is that if you use your Q learning in a naive way, in a way if you always take the action which maximizes the Q function, you're gonna end up in this vicious circle. You see, once your robot uh, has fallen down and it has observed that falling down gives you some positive value, the situation is that your Falling down strategy gives you positive value, while any other action is zero. So by definition, you're always falling down, because this is the optimal action you know of. Now, of course, this is not right. This is not right because your, your Q function is not perfect. So basically, the problem here is that your robot is kind of greedily exploiting whatever the uh, knowledge he's able to obtain, and he's not trying to get more knowledge, even though some other actions might turn out to be even more optimal than he thinks of his current optimal action. So this issue is very kind of ancient, and it basically comes down to the problem of exploring environment versus trying to utilize your knowledge about the environment to get the highest reward. You've actually, as I've mentioned, solved this uh, two weeks ago, if the memory serves me right. And in that case, you've used a very duct tape-ish method, which is not going to be that far from the optimal one. What did you do? Yeah, right. In case of uh, well, in case of banner ad, uh, in case of banner advertisement, what you did is you simply allowed your algorithm to sometimes turn out the best action, but the random one. In this case, what you have to do is for this mobile robot, you have to introduce some kind of probability with which you take a random action, because if you always take an optimal action, you're gonna stuck in this local optimal. Now, again, the problem of exploration and exploitation is of course much more complicated in the way it's postulated and has much more advanced solutions. For this week, however, we're only going to consider the bare minimum, the semi-heuristic exploration strategies. They do have some guarantees of convergence, but we only introduce them because that's how we can get the problem of exploration out of the way ASAP. Now, of course, there'll be much more than stuff, but it's coming to you during the last week of our course. The simplest exploration strategy that you've probably already discovered is the so-called epsilon greediest exploration. The epsilon here is the probability of taking a random action. So whenever a agent is tasked to pick an action, what it does is it basically flips a coin or, well, rolls a random number. With probability epsilon, it takes an action uniformly sampled from the uh, set of all possible actions. Otherwise, it just takes the argmax of the Q function. Typical values of epsilon are again 0 0.1, 0 0.05, 0 0.0, even less if the problem demands it. The epsilon greedy algorithm, however, has a few drawbacks. They are quite easy to distinguish once you start to think how this guy is going to take decisions. In fact, all the possible actions except optimal one are equally probable for it to explore, and they are in a way equally attractive. This is of course not true. In a way, if you're trying to find a way to walk forward, you can try another way, say of running or maybe jumping, some other strategy of going forward, to perhaps get a more reward per second. But uh, for epsilon media strategy, you're just as likely to try sitting down on your back for like 100th time just because the probability is equal. You can modify this logic by using another strategy, it's called the Boltzmann exploration strategy. The idea here is that you simply try to make your Q values, action values, into some kind of probability distribution and sample from them. As you probably remember from the deep learning course or any advanced machine learning course whatsoever, whenever you want to make something into a probability distribution, what you do is you apply some linearity, in this case softmax. So we take an exponent of each uh, Q function, and then divide it by the sum of exponents. 
we also multiply each q function by this factor of tau. In this case, if tau is very large, then all the q values are going to be approximately equal, and the probability is going to be almost uniform. If the t of the tau, however, approaches zero, you'll get the strategy which is more and more resembling of the greedy optimal action picking strategy. Now, this does sound a little bit more sophisticated, but in fact, you can as easily think up a way where the softmax policy is worse than the epsilon greedy one. For example, if you have an action which is underexplored, which has zero action value because you've never tried it, another two actions which are inferior but they have positive values because that's the kind of reward you get, you always get positive reward. Well, the issue here is you're probably better off with your gut feeling. So if you feel that uh, this policy is better, this uh, well, softmax one, or if you're feeling like you can adjust maybe a mixture of those two policies, and the experiment shows that you're right, then that's the optimal way you can do, you can solve this problem so far. Again, we have a more advanced uh, topics about this one later on in the course. Another huge issue with those exploration policies that does actually uh, affect their asymptotic and their algorithmic properties in a negative way, is the fact that under, say, epsilon greedy strategy, you're always going to explore. So the problem here is that if you have an epsilon of, say, 0.1, then you'll never be able to always take optimal action. You'll never be able to behave optimally because you're always forced to flip a coin and say, if tails, then explore. If you know that by design your problem is solvable, so your agent will eventually converge to an optimal solution, then what you can do is you can decrease the epsilon. For example, you can start with a large value of 0.5 because at the beginning the agent knows nothing, like John Snow, and it's no point in trying to listen to its uh, foul Q values any better than the random ones. Then, after the, as the training goes by, you can gradually reduce it. For example, by multiplying this 0.5 by 0.99 each time you finish a full session, for example. Then, by the time you finish, say, a hundred or a few hundred sessions, the epsilon is going to be really close to zero. And in the infinity, mathematically speaking, speaking, the algorithm is going to behave greedily because the epsilon converges to zero. Now, this is how you can technically weasel away with the fact that you're exploring all the time, but also going to exploit eventually. But this procedure is really dangerous when you apply it haphazardly. For example, imagine that you're having an environment that changes its properties over time. You're having the binary add uh, prediction problem, and your, uh, your key audience, it changes because there are more people uh, approaching your new service over time, and the distribution changes. In this case, it's never a good idea to completely throw away exploration because you have to adapt, you have to train your network, and without uh, using epsilon or any other exploration means, you have no way of getting away from the local optimum. This is the kind of the definitive guide into exploration in two minutes or less. And if you want to get more about exploration, which is indeed a super complicated problem, I encourage you to survive until the last week of the course.